Hello everyone, welcome back to a long overdue episode of the Cast of Zorro. I'm your host, Jack Clock, and today we have the Worm Man and Hello. our good friend Sean. How you doing, Sean? I'm good. How is everybody? How's the studio audience? <laughs> Hopefully they're all doing good, especially with all the stuff that's been happening since we've been last gone. Oh my god, there's been there's been a lot of like Zoro stuff happening and stuff like that. And with the first of all being the new Oh my god, how can I say this in a way that shows how important this is? For the first time in almost twenty years, a new Zoro show has released for everyone to watch. Sequoia Studios Zorro has finally released on Amazon Prime. Last and we're not just talking about any kind of like, you know, off brand yeah. Like, yeah. Oh hey, this is a Zorro kids show for little toddlers. This mm-hmm. isn't your grandma Zorro. This is <laughs> like an actual live action version of the character that fencing we got romantical tension we've got i mean like that's got, i mean yeah. zoro that's like 75 percent of it we've got bernardo we've got horseback riding we've got <laughs> the old uh, hispanic west all right what's not to love for zoro fans i know right hmm I was just thinking about how in like the first ten minutes you you got like two major characters killed off, which if I don't know if Disney or any uh, any typical kids programming would have that just like the the main character uh, Zoro dies. It is such a it is a very bold version of the character. There has not been as different of a version of Zoro as there was for Sequoia Studios Zoro. Like, the show feels like a Zoro show. Like, this is Zoro. You can definitively say it is. But it is so different, so out there compared to every other version. I love that so much. I know it, that's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but... Like at the same time, it is such a it, it is such a unique take on the character in the world, and I I can't wait to talk about that later. But oh my god, the fact that there is a new Zoro show out is absolutely insane. I honestly, when I was younger, I never thought that was ever gonna happen. I never thought that this day that like the day would ever come to pass that when the show coming uh coming out on um. Uh, January 19th. I I never thought I'd be able to live through that. And I know a bunch of other Zoro fans who've thought the same way, who are like, you know, Zoro's kind of a thing of the past now. We can only really enjoy his older content or read some of the recent books and comics. But no, we are finally actually having new Zoro content on the screen that's not little kids cartoons and that is i don't know it is such i'm still i'm still recovering from it honestly i'm still completely shocked we have um a technical issue uh jack has unfortunately passed away just now due to a zoro overdose (laughs) that is that is on that is so true the um i binged the show for almost like 10 hours the day it came out i'm pretty sure i almost died several times <laughs> speaking of dying and zoro oh uh, yes let's talk about the other release of zoro that has come out uh this time it's a comic zoro man of the dead by sean gordon murphy the creator of batman white knight has finally also released right before the sequoia studio zoro show and Oh boy, it is really good. We're not gonna be um we're not gonna be covering it for this episode in depth or anything like that, but I will say it is an absolutely fantastic read. If you really want like another out there Zoro comic, kinda like the American mythology run, this one's definitely it. But instead of like supernatural elements, it's placing 
Zoro in the modern world. And yes, I'm aware Zoro Generation Z did that. And yes, I'm aware Rise Again did that in 1937. But like this, like it, it's like if you took like the bombastic swashbuckling Zoro and you put him in like a gritty narco scenario, and the I I really don't want to spoil much. It is such an out there concept. I know I keep saying that with Sequoia Studios and now this, but Zoro Man of the Dead as a comic in the best way possible is absolutely bonkers. You need to read it for yourself, especially now that issue two is uh, coming out as well. Um, I haven't even read issue two yet, and I'm but I've read issue one. It's absolutely insane, and I definitely recommend it to anyone who'd want to see it. Even if like you haven't really read any Zoro comics, any uh, any thoughts on the the two new Zoro stuff coming out before we move on? Well, I feel like we will do more talking about the Sequoia Studio Zoro. So I'd like to put my two bits in first about the uh, comic. First of all, me not a big comic reader overall. You know, I've never really read like old school Marvel or DC or anything like that, but I have read some of the Zorro comics and if it lives up to anything that I've seen there, I feel like this may just be like the action comic to get, especially if you're a Zorro fan, but even if not, like there's a huge change of tone between comic Zorro and movie Zorro. Mm. Comic Zorro really doesn't need to adhere to the laws of gravity or sensibility True. compared to that of uh, live action Zorro. In most of Zorro's comic runs, some of the most intense moments in the whole franchise come from the comics. Like, the movies and TV shows, yeah, they can be pretty intense sometimes, but a lot of them still have to adhere to the fact that Zoro is, for the most part, a family franchise. But the comics do not. The comics, if you want a Zoro story, we're not like dark and gritty Zoro, but like Zoro in a more mature adult kind of world, the comics, the uh, I recommend the Dynamite run in 2008, the American Mythology run in 2018, and this modern new run from Sean Gordon Murphy and Massive Publishing. All three of them have that kind of swashbuckling charm and essence to it, but they also douse it in a lot of intensity and r like realness and stuff like that. It's really... I, I just recommend that you read Zorro comics in general, even if you're not, like, a crazy, you know, comic reader. And that's pretty much my two cents on the whole thing. I think now we should probably move on. I feel like, um, you know, I, I feel like we don't really... This, the podcast isn't really a good format to talk about comics in depth. But... That's true. Yeah. But... Uh, let's uh, let's start actually talking about the Sequoia Studios Zorro. Um, how, uh, who wants to who wants to say anything about the show? If if, if uh, you guys don't want to, then I'll perfectly happily open up. Um, I would like for you to open up because I feel like my uh, my natural charm bounces off you having good exposition. That is yeah, I, completely fine. I can open up, but I had I had a couple uh, historical points that I would like to make, maybe after you go, Mister Clock. Don't worry, my friend. We'll get there. All right. Alrighty. All right. So I'll start. the 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 show hooks you almost at the beginning, like the first ten minutes of the show. Like in general, if a, a movie or a TV show, it has to hook you in the first ten minutes. For it to really stick with you for the other several other minutes, and this show did it in spades. It opens up with like you know a cult or a group or something like that. I I know what they are, but I don't want to spoil it to anyone. You know, killing people and stuff like that, and then you get like them fighting Don Alejandro and then Zorro, and then like. You get, like, these two really cool action sequences, like, back-to-back, -back, and the whole time, you get to, like, see what 
you get to see Zoro in a 21st century action context, which blew my mind when I first saw the show. One of the things that we often have to reckon with, especially watching older Zoro movies, is that they are, in fact, the product of their time. Even things as, like, legendary as the 1975 Zoro uh, end fight, which is a, like, 12 to 15 minute back and forth between two characters, no music, just pure choreographed swordplay. You kind of have to stand back in awe at this show's opening fights which both have more of this like there are a few cuts in it like it's Mm -hmm. not the same as the 1975 one but the way the the choreography is done where every little detail in a scene could possibly be used for either the protagonist Zoro or for one of the antagonists to try to employ in a fight is it's, it reminds me a little bit of, like, modern action movies uh, akin to... Maybe John Wick is not a, the best example, but something more along those lines where it's high action-packed, fast-paced, in-your-face. You can't miss any small detail, otherwise the context of the fight shatters. Um, I'll give a, I'll try to give an example of that where... In the ending fight, when the Zor- when Zoro was trying to break free the prisoner, um, he has to go through some guards. And there are times that are sort of more reminiscent of older Zoro, where he'll sweep his sword once and he'll take out four guards by the legs in one fell swoop. But he goes up against, like, a random glup shitto guard, and, like, for a good 15 to 20 <laughs> seconds, he's kind of going back and forth with the guy, uh, and the other guard, like, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but, like, he tries to push something over, like, that's something Zoro is supposed to do. Mm-hmm. What are you doing, random guard number five? <laughs> like an extra who forgot that you weren't casted for Zoro? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So, for me, it feels almost like more modern action movies because you have... First of all, the guards are not random, like, poorly coded AI. Yeah. They just, like, bump into each other and only walk straight forward at Zoro and miss their first attack. That's first. (laughs) Which I cannot possibly overstate how important that is, that the soldiers feel like proper enemies and threats Mm -hmm. for a young up-and-coming Zoro to fight. Exactly. And even the older Zoro, like, yeah, he managed to, like, fight through a ton of them, but you could tell, like, they were constantly pressuring him and stuff like that during the church fight. Um, The previous Zoro, uh, Pomakwakur, he is... Like, yeah, he's doing cool tricks and stuff like that, fighting the soldiers, but you can tell that he's only barely able to keep them away from him until Monasterio ends the fight. And, like, it, as for the prison fight with Diego, yeah, like, sure, he does get the advantage on, like, the soldiers and stuff like that, but that's usually he has to be really creative or really fast, because otherwise, you know, they start basically manhandling him, and... It reminds me a lot of the Antonio Banderas Zorro in the beginning, uh, in like his first ever fight scene as Zorro in the the barracks, where he's basically yeah he's fighting a ton of soldiers and like not instantly dying, but he's also messing up all the time. He's constantly on, you know, he's on the back foot, constantly being pressured, and he's also the victim of a bit of slapstick, just like the the new Miguel Bernadel Zorro in this one. And I like that a lot. It, he doesn't instantly fit into his new role as Zoro. I love that about Diego. Like he he learns more as the show progresses. But in episode one, right now, he's basically very much an upstart. I also I think you bring up a great point in that there's a lot of like slapstick because you do kind of need to have something to poke fun at 
in these fights, especially in a more modern context, where it seems like Zoro is okay with just absolutely game-ending people. True. And being rather brutal. So having so a few moments of slapstick or even just funny parts, just things that are a little bit silly, that kind of helps make it more digestible rather than Zoro literally fighting for his life and slaying other human beings True. to to get to a, accomplish a goal. There uh, needs to be... Not, I, not I, to, I, oh, uh, Sean? Yes? Yeah, not to interrupt, but I think uh, a, a pretty good comparison would be the tone that uh, Disney Star Wars and um, Marvel movies use in their fight scenes mm -hmm. where there's a lot of action but there's also a um, a uh, a little bit of slapstick to yeah. cut some of the tension and uh <laughs> probably lower the rating i i say with air quotes <laughs> yeah yeah like um <sighs> trying to think of um trying to think of a good example of that uh like for example it's on the tip of my tongue. I'd say, like, um, for example, uh, yeah, the the Rise of Skywalker does something similar when Ben Solo is fighting the the Knights of Ren, and one of them yeah. swings at him and he ducks down, and he he just zooms into the camera a little bit and goes whoo, and it, like just little little bits of like humor like that can add to a fight scene really well, and I feel like the new show does that. The new show does that really well. Like, the show can be funny when it needs to be. And when it needs to be funny, it is funny. And it works really well. And I really like that about it. Because normally, it is very... It is a very serious show. It's a more serious version of the character. And I, I, I really appreciate that. Like, if the first Zoro we've gotten since Legend of Zoro, which is a goofy, campy schlockfest was another goofy campy schlockfest i would have been a little upset but the fact that it mixes tone so well it it can be really serious in one fight but another fight can maybe be a little more banter and stuff like that or like for example um like comparing the prison fight with the last stand of the original zoro uh paul michael Kerr, uh, his last stand has no jokes in it. His f whole fight, it it's a serious and actually very sad scene where he basically goes out like a boss while fighting tons of soldiers. And that works equally as well as the, you know, the more comedic fight with Diego as he's being thrown around by soldiers and stuff like that and then like zooming into the camera and going ah! and it, it, it fits it fits completely in the story like both fights feel like they belong in the same story which I find really cool and the future episodes of the show also do a pretty good job in mixing tones and fighting it in general uh, what else do we talk about? Um, I'd say speaking of Diego, I feel like his version, Miguel Bernadette's version of Diego is, it is more nuanced and more vulnerable than other versions of the character we've gotten. And I love that so much. I've seen some people complain, like, why isn't he all suave and super masculine and stuff like that Gentlemanly and pretending to be a coward but I, I got I get what you mean Jack I think it's because of the slightly more serious direction of the show I feel like having a Zoro that kind of feels more like Batman in that you know for for Batman Batman is the real deal and Bruce Wayne is a disguise normally for Zorro I feel like Zorro's a disguise and Diego de la Vega is the real person but having like Zorro kind of be 
written in the per in his personality because he kind of has this like I feel like um I wouldn't call it distrust but I think vulnerabilities is definitely a good way to put it yeah I'd say um the thing about this version of Diego is I think the fact is uh or like I don't know Zoro I feel like for Zoro in the new show is the disguise but the disguise that he has when he's not wearing the mask it, like he's normally himself he just omits certain parts of his personality from people if that makes sense like he still acts the same way he normally does but he just doesn't mention a lot of the you know his dislike of oppression and stuff like that he cuts out a lot of the parts of his personality that are disagreeable to his enemies and it makes him appear far more trustworthy to them than he is and i feel like zoro is very much the disguise because it was kind of a role thrust upon him by um by kiyoche and um corvo nocturno basically it's not it's more like a job i'd say if that makes sense like it's diego is still kind of himself but like in this new role he's basically playing uh, a bit and it's not the real him but it's also not not him and i feel like it's way different compared to like other versions of zoro because i feel like other versions of zoro um the line between what is the mask and what is the real part of diego has always been a blur like sure you could argue zoro embodies his courage and his fire but diego or don diego also embodies diego de la vega's you know kindness and vulnerability and like kind of lack of toxicity and i feel like i don't know it, i i could i could ramble on all day about disguises and stuff like that about diego there's there's I, I feel like there's a lot of nuance and it even depends on the version too but i feel like um this is the most transparent version of diego we've ever gotten like he is it's the version of diego that's the most himself like the most comfortable in his own skin but also the diego that's the most emotionally open and vulnerable we see him uh you know we see him distraught over his father's death we you know we see him pretty scared and anxious about his new situation about just becoming zoro now when all he wants to do is just find out who killed his dad and then everyone's walking up to him like oh hey you're the new zoro now that's pretty cool or hey you're the new zoro now i'm gonna try and stab you with a spear and we kind of see a lot of his emotional reactions and stuff like that. Previous versions of Zoro, I wouldn't say that they were emotionless, but many of them are, as you mentioned before, with the action, a product of their times. And with previous versions of Zoro, while they had a lot less constraint than other uh, male action heroes at the time, Zoro still kind of obeyed the rule at the time of like well if you're a guy you can't show as much emotion openly and stuff like that if you want to appear tough but like this version of Zoro is very like you can tell he is absolutely you know tough as nails but also he's this he's absolute sweetie too like he I think the casting of Miguel Bernadette was a genius choice too because he does not resemble the the cool, suave, you know, playboy, Spaniard Don that, you know, other actors tend to do. He's this, like, adorable, young, bright-eyed man with this cute little smile, and... Yeah, I, I was actually thinking, uh, <laughs> it, it might be weird for me to say this... Be mostly because I don't know where the guy was born, but I was just struck by how American he looked. Uh, the the actor who is playing uh, the new Zorro, which is really funny too, because he's Spanish, but a lot of people keep getting fooled by like his looks and stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's and I think it honestly, 
that's another ingenious part of his casting too because you know Nalin is like why um is she you know after finding out diego's zoro she goes up to cuervo nocturno she's like why is this white boy zoro <laughs> why why didn't Kyoto choose a native american person to be zoro like you know with the last one my brother and he's like oh well you know it's a new zoro for different times and she's like but he's some rich white twink like that's, why that's right he said uh, a rich man can't defend the poor yeah and i i can't wait to get into nolan later but um yeah. with diego i feel like his casting was honestly inspired i feel like miguel bernadal like he is spanish and you know he does play the part of a california bubble like he also kind of sticks out like a sore thumb and I feel like that's kind of the point. I feel like a lot of people kind of miss the point. They're like, why did they cast this this blonde white toy to be Zoro? But like, <coughs> sorry. But it Diego's supposed to be different in this version. He's supposed to be he's supposed to be kind of a fish out of water. He's supposed to be more youthful and more like vulnerable more like relatable and keep in mind the show is also very much for younger generations uh my generation is a very different sensibility on what uh like a man or even an, att an attractive man should be compared to older generations like you know millennials you know they found antonio banderas incredibly attractive and stuff like that when mask of zorro came out and i'm not i'm not knocking that i i'm not i'm not yucking your yum oh, but for someone for but for some but for someone but for someone in my generation i don't know we typically find like the more like pretty sensitive type of guy to be more attractive it, that, that's just me that's you know I, i'm not speaking for everyone but i'm saying that it de it's definitely a choice that vibes pretty well for a lot of people. And, um... Oh, God. Speaking of, like... Speaking of, like, character casting that was, like, really good... Bernardo. Bernardo is amazing in this show. I love the guy so much. Um, apparently, he's played by a famous uh, physical comedy actor, uh, Paco Tus. Yeah. And... He's amazing. Okay, there's a lot of versions of Bernardo I do very much like. And I think my favorite one in particular is the one from the 2008 comics, but that's beside the point. But this version of Bernardo, I can definitely see why it would be a lot of people's favorite. He is this absolute precious man who needs to be protected at all costs. He... Like, speaking of, like, vulnerability, like, going back from Diego... Bernardo also has a lot of that and like even though he doesn't say a line of dialogue at all you know because Bernardo's mute obviously but you can tell you can always tell how he feels even if there's no dialogue in the scene that is something no other version of the character has ever achieved like obviously everyone always knows about Gene Sheldon's iconic portrayal of Bernardo I love I I, I love Gene Sheldon's Bernardo a lot but there's a lot of he like even like with Gene Sheldon's Bernardo as much as I love him you kind of required sorry you kind of required Don Diego to be there to translate for him because he didn't actually do sign language or at least a version we know of he specifically spoke in signs to Diego Diego uh, translated it for the audience and that's how we got to know Bernardo's point of view and that's that's fine I'm not knocking that but this version of Bernardo works so well as his own character and like also his face too his face is very emotive which definitely helps a lot with how like him expressing his character the scene alone where diego gets home and sees him for the first time in years and the two of them are you know are really happy to see each other and bernardo just looks so excited to see him again and they the subject gets to like alejandro and his death and bernardo 
has this absolutely despondent look to his face that absolutely broke my heart when I first saw it. And I, I cannot give enough credit to Paco Tus. He is absolutely amazing in this episode alone. Throughout the entire series, he's also amazing. But in this episode alone, I was absolutely sold on his character. I'll agree with you there. I think Bernardo is one of the best things to come out of this uh, version. Um, he is funny, and I also agree for the most part that, like, other Bernardos sometimes... They're only there for either humor or to be a plot point. Oh, Bernardo is actually going to pretend to be Zoro for this uh, episode. Oh, Bernardo got captured because the villain thinks that they're working with Zoro as well as Don Diego. And if Bernardo doesn't trick them good enough, then maybe they'll find out that Zoro is Don Diego. But I also think that having Bernardo be a little bit more... No, a little bit less carefree, even though they're still funny, they feel like their actions matter more to the universe. Yeah. Sometimes Bernardo is like, oh, the, the, Bernardo is uh, waiting underneath that bench over there. Oh, Zoro's fighting off ten bad guys. Bernardo uh, reaches his hand out and accidentally trips one of the guards. Oh, that changed the outcome of the fight for sure. <laughs> like, it, sometimes Bernardo just doesn't. Yeah, like, I don't know, this version of Bernardo, like, he feels... I just love it. He just feels like his own character with his own, like... His own ways of helping out Diego, too. The only Bernardo that I think I like more than this one is the Bernardo that isn't actually a Bernardo, which is um, the Antonio Banderas uh, first movie where De, De La Vega is pretending to be Bernardo as Marietta is pretending to be a nobleman. Yeah, uh, that is that is pretty funny. Which I feel like is there's a lot of levels of nuance there, and he's allowed to be more expressive and more emotive because he's considered to be a, a very important character of the plot, anyways. But for the time, where like he's just pretending to be a lowly servant with the glasses on the tip of his nose, looking down, and any time that Marietta makes a joke, he'll like chuckle to himself, or if there's like an ironic musing he'll be a little bit like more serious like oh no what is Diego gonna do here oh Zoro better to... I feel like that is a it's funny it's lighthearted. it also adds so much to both Bernardo as an idea and to Diego as an idea that's yeah that that that, that honestly makes a lot of sense and it's a good choice too I didn't even think about like counting Antonio, uh, uh, Anthony Hopkins as a version of Bernardo, but like that, honestly, yeah, that 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 makes a lot of sense. And this new version of Bernardo, I just, I don't know, I I think it's I, I just think it's really cool that like he's very he's also just very funny, but he's rarely if ever the butt of the joke. And like I, a lot of the comedy is just him, you know, talk. Uh, interacting back and forth with Diego and a lot of the times you know it's just him just like like him kind of just criticizing Diego's Zoro outfit and stuff like that like that's really funny and also and uh, like Bernardo is also really important to the plot too in outside of kind of helping Zoro sometimes he's literally the one that starts Diego on the journey of finding his father's killers He's the one that is able to set everything straight with, like, oh, Zoro didn't kill your father, the people in masks and hoods did, which is very important. And, I don't know, I, I just feel like he's a really, I feel like he's, he's, he's handled really well, and I'm glad that he's handled it all, because I wasn't sure there was going to be a version of Bernardo when the show was, like, in development. Um, I think the easiest way to exemplify it is when 
she nearly takes his head off with a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was such a good scene. Yeah, that was that was honestly what really funny. Hell? You shot me in the head. It's like, no, I only took your hat off. Don't worry. What's wrong with you? <laughs> My, I noticed that the um, the the skirt she was wearing in in the scene where she was where she meets uh, uh, Diego is the same um, pattern and texture as the shirt worn by uh, uh, Diego's father in the scene that he dies. So I, I wonder I wonder if there's a connection between the two characters that this um, that this costume uh, choice implies. Um, let's see, but like um personally I think with Lolita's character I I like her character a lot. I, I don't know, but, like, um, there's something about the character that kind of holds me back from loving the character. But, like, I like her a lot, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like she's really fun in, like, interacting with Diego and stuff like that. I feel like, um, you know, her love of guns and ha top hats and stuff like that is pretty entertaining I love that she absolutely takes no no BS from Diego at all. I, it's very funny. And um, I love how they set up her relationship with Monasterio, which, oh boy, that was a huge surprise for a lot of people. Um, Monasterio doesn't get much to do in this episode outside of... a some fight scenes and stuff but the fact that like it the bombshell of oh yeah Zoro's love interest is actually dating someone else and it's the guy who is the big bad evil dude in the Disney Zoro and it, it it is so interesting to like it's a really interesting setup and well obviously it's about oh, I'm talking about the first episode alone and not the whole show it sets up a lot of really interesting conflict but also a lot of interesting subversions in the the story itself and uh, I don't know here's the thing about Lolita though while I do really like her character I feel like her character could also be a bit flat like she's um it's hard to explain she's fun but she's not as nuanced as some of the other characters I don't think she's as nuanced as Diego. I don't think she's nu as nuanced as Nalin or Monasterio. I, I she's fun, but like it, it doesn't feel like there's as much effort put into her and flushing her out as a person compared to some of the other characters. It's kind of a shame, but like she's she's still fun. She she gets a lot of laughs out of me. She um uh you know her shooting Diego's top hat is iconic. I absolutely love that, and I don't know. It's I, at this rate, I'm just nitpicking. I I still I, I think she did great. I think her her actress Renata, uh, Renata Notney played the character very well. I think we've talked a lot about like characters and stuff like that. So I wanted to mention uh, something that I appreciated. The, uh, the inclusion of the Russian-American company. Um, Go on. Alrighty. So, in uh, the 17 and 1800s, Rush, uh, the Russian Empire tried to colonize North America, and they succeeded in colonizing Alaska and had a couple... Um, a couple outposts in Hawaii and uh, California, uh, notably um, Fort Alexandria in Hawaii and uh, Fort Ross in Northern California. Uh, in in California, uh, the Russian American Company uh, hunted uh, a lot of our river otters and sold their pelts back to um, back to uh, the the Russian Empire. I 
like that they're included. It's it's a good uh, a good inclusion of of history and historical context, and uh, it ties us to our present day with um, with our own anxieties about uh, Russian influence in um, in in our. Uh, <laughs> in in our uh, governments, uh, I don't know when this is going to be released, but we're currently recording on the two-year anniversary of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, and I would just like to conclude this bit with Slava Ukraini. Slava Ukraini. But um, you bring up an excellent point, by the way. The 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 incorporation of the Russian American uh, corporation, it essentially um, it I love the um, the show is obviously very fantastical. I I'm not quite sure if there's a historical precedent for uh, uh, Fox God choosing uh, you know some twink to become a, a vigilante <laughs> spirit warrior, but I um, I do very much know about the details of like in this episode the russian american company in later episodes the chinese american communities this show covers a lot of parts of californian history that's often not talked about and it just it makes the world feel so much more alive like yeah zoro as a franchise has always had pretty good representation with like you know uh hispanic and latino stuff and even Native Americans as well for even for even for like its time it had pretty decent Native American representation just ignore Zoro's fighting legion um <laughs> but the fact that we get to accurately see groups like the Russian American Corporation which only ever appeared once before in Walt Disney's Zoro and honestly not much um it's just really cool like I just, I, I just really appreciated that they added that little slice of history in there and incorporated it into the plot very well. And uh, later on in the show, you'll see more of those two characters in their own little schemes and plots. And it really adds a lot of depth, especially with the, the otter skins and furs. Like, that's mentioned in the show. And, like, oh, yeah. yeah, the... the because they plan to take a lot of the Native American territory and use that for the otter fur trade. And that's why uh, Corvo Nocturno blows up some of their stuff. And also to get himself caught so Diego would get him out. But th that's beside the point. Yeah. And I, 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 just, I just find it really cool. Like, I, I just... It's really nice to see a lot of, like, stuff about California's more obscure history that not a lot of people know about added into the show and I, I hats off to Sequoia Studios for that it's really cool and honestly I think you might have a point I feel like they were probably saying something about Russian influence on uh, our geopolitics I can definitely see something like that I can I can see the resemblance between uh, Andreevich and uh Putin. I, I might be reading too much into there, but... I... I, I mean, maybe. I, I I personally didn't see a a, a physical connection between... Yeah, no, not a, not a physical... Let me, huh? let me just uh, rewind so that I can get a good look at the fella again. Oh, I mean, I mean, didn't mean like, like look, I mean like the, the vibes, I guess. Okay, yeah. He's he's got that Russian imperial villain energy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, I I, I thought it was very cool. I thought he, he I think he's um in general because I I know how the Russian plot turns out. Like he's very fun villain. He and his assistant, they're both great I villains, like, huh? I like this hat. Yeah, I, 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 I they, the, the, thingy on it. the Russians have drip in that, in this show, they have absolute drip, I love it, and honestly, all the characters have drip, like, 
obviously like um the Zoro outfit there um there's we only see one of the two Zoro outfits in this first episode but even then it's such a good one and I love um it, it's really interesting to see the how it fills out with different characters we um we first see it being worn by uh Pullman Quaker and he wears it absolutely flawlessly. The suit completely fits around him. The mask completely fits around him. And he looks so badass in it. We see Diego near the end wear it. And while he looks pretty okay in it, it doesn't fit him. And I I feel like I feel like that was completely intentional, by the way. Cause like even Bernardo kind of points out like, eh, when Diego's like, how do I look? I feel like cause Zoro is growing and changing Diego, but right now Diego he doesn't exactly fit as Zoro, so he doesn't fit in the costume, and I find it really genius. And also, it kind of adds to the comedy of the prison fight, and even his duel with Nalin's kind of funny when he has like the derpy looking mask on as he's getting kicked around by her, and. I, I, I thought it was a really nice touch. I think it is a beautiful looking outfit, and we'll get to definitely see more of it later. I don't want to spoil how, but we will. Um, and not just the Zoro outfit, the costumes in general. Now, I've had um, a decent amount of people, including my mom, who's uh, uh, very knowledgeable about historical outfits, you know, kind of talking about how a lot of them are very inaccurate and sure that is definitely a slight against the show if you want but it's also it feels authentic because they feel right if that makes sense they feel like they completely fit in with spanish california and like even the more ridiculous ones like diego yes as you um you mentioned this to me while watching it he's wearing a purple outfit and stuff like that to a funeral he brought his, his pimp coat to the uh to the funeral <laughs> <laughs> and then or like drip or drown in this world <laughs> <laughs> or like diego and lolita wearing like these big ass top hats and stuff like that like yeah it's it's over the top but it works so well i absolutely love it a lot every character is absolutely dripped out it's perfect like i i, hmm? I, I did enjoy uh the uh pole bearers with the world's largest top hats <laughs> oh my god yeah they, hmm? they, they brought their doug dimadone hats <laughs> <laughs> they really did and then um i don't know if monasterio wears it in this episode but he's like you know like a napoleon hat and stuff like that it looks really goofy on him Is but it kind of works first episode? i'm not know. sure that's I'm not sure. I, I, I don't remember him wearing anything like that. So, uh, I, maybe it's later on. But yeah. Um, my point is though, like a lot of the character outfits and stuff like that look really. I don't know. They just look really nice. And oh, uh, let's see. Uh, I also absolutely um love. I I don't know if I doubt they're historically accurate, but the Native American outfits are really good too. They have a very stylish but also kind of practical look to them especially a lot of nalin's outfits like also like a lot of her face paints are just cool they're so cool i i love them but um in general i i i really i really felt like in a in a world of drip or drown they dripped so um is there anything about the the show that anything about the show that you guys specifically really liked or the the, the episode uh let's see, i like... don't know if i have any more that wouldn't beg repeating something that has already been said um for context for me some of the details that you have mentioned are um completely new to me because I did not watch with subtitles on hmm. and uh, could not understand a lick of Spanish. <laughs> that's uh, that's completely fair. Um, I think I will bring up a few 
little things before I think we wrap it up and get to the next topic. But um, one of the um, I've been saving this the whole time, but my favorite character has a really good introduction in uh, this first episode, Nolan. I don't want to spoil all the crazy awesome stuff that happens with her in the future episodes, but she has such a strong start in the in the in the beginning and actually in the end of the episode. She her like her arc begins with her basically going through the same thing Diego goes through in real time where she has her family taken away from her and unlike diego who's trying to investigate and stuff like that about everything that's going on she knows who murdered her brother in cold blood and she really really wants to do something about it she's angry she is lost her heart is absolutely broken from the whole thing and she's really eager to take her brother's place as Zoro and fight the oppressors. And then she learns that not only was she not chosen, but some random, like, white toy is instead chosen to be Zoro instead of her. And obviously from our perspective, we know that Diego's fit to be Zoro. But from her perspective? Why? Why him? And... It, it angers her. It confuses her. It it feels like a slap in the face to everything that her brother died for. And it begins her, you know, her rejecting the god that she chose specifically to chase down becoming Zoro and killing Diego for the role. And by the time that we see her again, by the end of the first episode, she, you can tell that she's going on a really dark path. She is filled with pure rage and hatred. Just just seeing her glaring at Diego while he's trying to get Cuervo and Eterno in his hacienda, like you can tell she is on a dark path right now. And she is really ready to mess up Diego. And she does mess him up in the fight. I love that like after watching him fight through the trained soldiers and stuff like that and managing to hold his own decently well it was so interesting then seeing him just get demolished by nalin in a one-on-one -on -one duel it was it was like such a good subversion of how you think it was gonna go and the fact like she just threatens him like hey if you keep being zoro i'm going to murder you and everyone you ever love like that is such a good way to leave the um, that is such a good way to absolutely leave that episode off. And honestly, I, I found it really interesting. Her character is super relevant in the beginning and ending. But like there's a lot of probably like she doesn't show up in the middle a lot. She I because like her character is basically stewing in her anger and her resentment until we see her at the end come out and she's just ready for war. And I, I feel like you know, I, I cannot give enough props to Dahlia Giacoatl for this character. And, like, she ha she plays, like, such a nuanced antagonist. Not even... The, she's the first ever antagonist in Zoro who's not a villain. And I love that so much about her. And, like, her character is the biggest highlight for me. I think that she's one of the most nuanced well-written Zoro characters in the franchise and it also doesn't help that i kind of have a massive crush on her character but um that, that's not the point the point is um genuinely like a very a very nuanced character a character that you could even like root for against Zoro you, yeah you understand their motivation yeah you understand her motivation and well yeah i mean she's not completely in the right you understand exactly why she's in you understand why she, that she's in this headspace of hers her people are being oppressed by the same social class as the people diego comes from and the fact that diego is now being charged to defend her from that same social class puts a lot of 
like questions in her mind like why why is this guy Zoro? what what makes him different from everyone else and while later on in the show we see her interact with him in more nuanced ways right now he is just he is enemigo numero uno for her and she she absolutely hates his guts and she wants to tear that mask off of his face if it means she has to tear his face off with it too and it makes her such a good antagonist and like as um uh, speaking of early from the ending by the way it's also really intense like she absolutely not only does she absolutely destroy him but diego himself his first ever z he carves is on himself specifically to you know throw off the trail of monasterio that is so hardcore i would have never thought of anything like that for a zoro story and i love it and the fact that it begins and ends uh, the the episode begins and ends with you know the the wall uh the wall text of like uh you know zoro vive and uh, zoro has returned it has a really nice you know opening and then bookend to the episode that just it just feels completely right i think that's all i have to say about the new show is there anything that you'd like to add before we maybe move on well, I also would like to briefly talk about the beginning, mm-hmm. because I feel like the I feel like having not just Alejandro but also Zoro done in that early and. It, It was, a, it was a ballsy what I don't move. Understand yeah. Is like why didn't like was that the like you were just helped? You thought there were only three of them, so you just opened the door and oh, there's another one, and then there were like four more who come out of the word woodwork. <laughs> like that, I just didn't understand. Like, shouldn't someone have known? that there were more like there were horses in the stables and stuff like that it wasn't just three why did zoro just ride off and uh de la vega's like oh, okay glad we're done with that <laughs> uh i mean yeah i guess that's fair but um i don't know i i think it's kind of a good idea for the the masked assailants to have a backup plan in case um because they because Zoro's been causing problems for them. I think they say it later on, um, you know, in a future episode. But Zoro's been causing them major problems. And the fact that, like, if Zoro shows up and rescues Alejandro, that they have a contingency plan to kill him just in case. And it was it was smart for one of them to, to for one of them to hide and wait for Don Alejandro to let his guard down, so so they can just absolutely put a cap in him. I, I I think I think it makes a lot of sense, and it it's also a huge surprise for people who aren't expecting it. So not me. Um, they're like they're like, oh, we saw Alejandro and Zoro tag team these guys. Everything's gonna be okay now, and then immediately have that shattered by Alejandro getting murdered by one of them. I don't know. This uh, this is my two cents yeah, on it. But... No, I understand. But, um, I think that's pretty much it for now. So, uh, the next one is a fan mail section. So, I'm gonna go take a look at the fan mail. If we don't have any, then I'm just gonna skip the section. Uh, we have one piece of fan mail. It is from King Gold Mod. King Gold Mod says, Hey all, Gold here, aka King, do an impromptu ranking of Spaghetti Zoro outfits. <laughs> Sincerely, the local madman who isn't Steve Buscemi. Um, Alright, so... The problem is, there's so many Spaghetti Zoro outfits out there, that, like, you can't just do a ranking of all of them. How about, how about Jack... How about we... Like, how about, a, instead of a ranking, because... We say our favorite. Time... Yeah, how about how about you give us a uh, your top three? Top three. Oh god. Um, 
I'd say, and, and maybe, and maybe, just maybe, a lucky loser too. Uh, your absolute least favorite. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, third is Rafaelito's outfit from Nephews of Zorro. Second is um, the Zorro Contra Machiste outfit. I feel like that one's pretty iconic. And the first one is the Zorro in the Court of England outfit. The Zorro in the Court of England has a um, it has a few variations of that outfit, and I think all of them look really good. And it has that kind of like '60s Western charm to it that I really dig. That's pretty much my answer uh, to that, King. I'm sorry I couldn't rank all of them, but there's so many of these. <laughs> there's so many of these damn things. You can't. I mean, you can ask for a ranking of all of them, and you know what? Maybe at some point we'll like publish an official tier list. But I don't think it's very productive. <laughs> True. I um, yeah. I don't think we can just list all of them, but um, I I wouldn't I wouldn't mind talking more in depth about it when I have the preparation. And as for the last one, uh, it's you know our opinion section. What is the funniest Zoro story? Like um, it, it, the it, in general, like what do you what is the one that get. Gay Blade, yeah, fair. Uh, actually, hmm? actually, I mean, Gay Blade is kind of an easy out. I would say the 1975 B plot, where you have, like, the KKK wannabes. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty fun. That's, it's out of nowhere, and it doesn't fit any of the rest of the film's tone, and it's just so over the top for no reason. I know, my jaw absolutely dropped when I first saw that. <laughs> oh my god, I... I don't even know why that was, like, in the film, too, because, like, I, I, I know that, um, because the movie was made in Europe, so they weren't intending for it to be, like, Ku Klux Klansmen or anything. They were just intending for it to be generic dis bandit disguises. So, like, right. I don't know what they were thinking at all. I don't know what was in the headspace of the, the filmmakers while they were doing that. And that honestly makes it, that honestly makes it even funnier. Bandit faction. Make sure you don't make them look too much like the clan. <laughs> True. But, um, yeah, Zorro 1975 is a good choice. There's a lot of humor in that one. There's a lot of seriousness, but there's also a lot of funny stuff. A lot of the earlier fights have a lot of um, like a lot of slapstick in it, as well as swashbuckling. And you know, of course, Gay Blade's a good choice, but I do agree that is kind of easy. Let's see. As for mine. I think that my pick for the funniest Zoro would probably be... Why am I struggling with this? I'd say it's probably the silent film. The silent film has, you know, since there's no dialogue in it, a lot of silent actors have to rely on incredible, exaggerated goofiness to really get the emotions across, especially humor. And anything with Sergeant Gonzalez alone in it is just automatically funny. Noah Beery Sr. just absolutely emanates pure comedy gold. And uh, Douglas Fair makes himself as Diego. He also plays this really funny, lazy kind of fop energy. Well, I mean, others do that too, like Tyrone Power and stuff. Douglas Fairbanks just does it in a way that's really funny, and, like, he just trolls everyone and is absolutely loving every second of it. I talk about it more in the first episode of the cast of Zorro, but in general, the, the comedy works really well there. And I think an honorable mention would probably be the Disney Zorro. The Disney Zorro has way less of a manic energy compared to the silent film, but it also has very well-structured comedy, especially with Sergeant Garcia. Sergeant Garcia can be written pretty poorly sometimes in other Zorro stories, but in the Disney Zorro, every Garcia joke felt like it was crafted to perfection. Like, you could really tell that they were like, how can we make Sergeant Garcia make the parents of the kids watching the show laugh just as much as the kids? 
and they really nail it out of the park nine times out of ten. And in general, there's a lot of really funny moments in general for the character. And I like the characters in general. I feel like uh, Bernardo gets a lot of funny comedy, and I love, like, he's not the butt of the joke usually. It, it's A lot of it is him reacting to odd situations and going, wow, that's weird. And it, it, it's just funny. I don't know why, it's just funny. But, um, so, we were moving on to our new topic, which is, what is the funniest version of Zoro? Or, like, the funniest Zoro story? Uh... I don't know. I've only seen this and Antonio Bandera and uh, one, one of the one of the black and white ones. All right, Very... I have a better question. Yeah. Where should I invest my um, my loose change that I've stored up over seventy years? Uh, getting Sean some Zoros. Yeah, <laughs> getting me Zoro swag. <laughs> But, um, I think that's the perfect place to leave it off. I, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a good, it's fun to do another one of these episodes again. I'm glad. Oh, wait. What? Oh, oh I, I had, um, a little bit of a fan submission. Uh, one of, one of the viewers at home, uh, named Ain, wanted to say, uh, I am very happy to hear there is a Zoro fandom. I'm I'm happy that there is a Zoro fandom. Other, otherwise, uh, I wouldn't be doing the show. But um, yeah, yeah if, you wouldn't have a job. <laughs> that is true. But um, all right. So um, uh, all right. So uh, I think we're going to end it off here. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure doing this episode. It's uh, it's amazing to be you know in a time where we get new Zoro content to talk about. And it's an absolute pleasure to do this show again. Uh, I'm Jack Clock. Uh, this is Worm and Sean, and we're signing off. Pop, pop, pop. Good night, Julie. Got home. <laughs>